In our last lesson, we learned that you have been forgiven all trespasses when you were baptized into Christ Jesus. Let me just take a moment to urge you to believe that and to receive it and to rejoice in it, that when you are baptized into Christ, buried with Him by baptism into death, God forgave you all trespasses. He associated you with guiltlessness and having the past remitted and once and for all forgiven. Your trespasses were forgiven you for Jesus' sake, not because you were baptized, but because your baptism puts you into the death of Christ, which spelled an end to sin and transgression. It was Jesus that God was satisfied with, and as you became identified with Christ, He became satisfied with you. You might put it this way, when Jesus Christ was baptized, God spoke out of heaven and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. When you were baptized, you said to God, I am well pleased with Jesus too. And therefore God was well pleased with you. Today we want to focus upon God blotting out what was against you. Something that was contrary to you and condemned you. Our text again is found in Colossians, the second chapter, in verse 14, where Paul is considering our baptism into Christ. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. The handwriting of ordinances was the first commandment, the first testament, the old covenant, or the Ten Commandments. It's called the law, or the law of Moses in Scripture. Baptism is a divinely appointed reference point that identifies you with the removal of the law. Our text in Colossians 2.14 is addressing people that have been buried with Christ by baptism. Let me refresh your mind with that twelfth verse. Buried with Him in baptism, wherein also you're risen with Him. It's to those that the word of the Lord says, there in the baptism, in your obedience to Christ, you became identified with Christ's death and the handwriting of ordinances, the inscribed commandments on tables of stone that were contrary to you and against you were taken out of the way. Out of the way between you and God. They no longer were a barrier between you and God. The commandments of God no longer separated you and God. Up until Christ Jesus, the commandments of God said, this is how God is, you are unlike this, therefore you're separated from God. But in Christ Jesus, the commandments of ordinances have been taken out of the way, no longer separating you from God. Now let's look at this handwriting of ordinances, the law of commandments containing ordinances that was against us. Why did God give the law then in the first place? Why did He give a law that would have to be taken out of the way? Why did He give handwriting of ordinances that was against us? Why did God do this? The Word of the Lord proclaims to us reasons behind this move. In Romans, the third chapter and verse 19, the apostle says, We know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth might be stopped, and all the world become guilty before God. The law was given then, once and for all, to bring an end to man's high opinion of himself. Man has, in fact, sinned and come short of the glory of God. He is contrary to God, alienated from God outside of Christ, and unable to fellowship with God. And yet in spite of this, man tenaciously clings to the notion that he's all right, that he's correct, and that he's acceptable with God the way that he is. God gave the law to identify the areas of man's infirmity, to show man that he had in fact sinned, that he was living contrary to God, that he didn't think like God or act like God, that he was different from God, vastly different from him. The law was given to stop the bragging mouth of man, and cause him to call upon the name of the Lord that he might be saved, to wrest from him self-confidence and teach him that his faith must rest in another. But there's another reason for the giving of the law, not only to stop every mouth and make the world guilty before God, or that is to say to make them aware of their guiltiness before God, 
Actually, the world was guilty before the law came, but it was unaware of the magnitude of its guilt, of the enormity of sin. So the law made sin as enormous as it really was. It enabled man to see sin like God saw it, separating man from God. In Romans 3.20, it states that by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law specified what sin was. It made, an, it made man able to give an intelligent appraisal of sin. It identified it, specified it, and enabled man to contemplate his actions in view of God's mind rather than of his own. By the law is the knowledge of of sin. In Romans the seventh chapter, the Apostle Paul said that before the law came, he didn't know what sin was. But after the law identified what sin was and said in particular, thou shalt not covet, he became aware that what he thought was quite innocent act, acts were all along violating the law of God. And he was guilty of sin. He knew he was guilty of sin because the law made him aware of sin. An interesting statement is made in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, and verse 56. It says that the strength of sin is the law. <clears throat> Some reading this text have supposed that the law of God, the Ten Commandments, the do's and don'ts of Scripture, actually make man sin, that they propel man into a sinful life. That once God informs man of what is right and wrong, that it is so contrary to man's will that it actually propels man into a life of sin. Thus, they say, uh, the law is the strength of sin. It actually makes people sin. This, of course, is not the case. God's law is holy and just and righteous, according to Romans, the seventh chapter. It does not make people sin. What the law does, it defiles a man's conscience. It convinces him that what he has done is ungodlike and unacceptable to God. And once the conscience of man is defiled, a wedge is driven between him and God. He does not come to God because he feels condemned in his presence. This is depicted in detail in the sin of Adam and Eve in Eden's garden. You'll recall there that God commanded them not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. After succumbing to the temptation of Satan and considering the tree, seeing that it was good for food and desired to make one wise and pleasant to the eye, and they indulged in it and sinned, their reaction to God indicated what the uh, text of Scripture, the strength of sin is the law, what this means. God came walking in the garden in the cool of the day and called out to Adam, where art thou? Adam and Eve had hidden themselves, afraid to approach unto God. They were separated from God, uncomfortable in God's presence, and they were aware of the fact they had broken God's holy commandment. Thus the strength of sin became the commandment. It defiled and contaminated their conscience and enslaved them to separation from God. It constrained them to flee away from God rather than come to Him. This was the unique ministry of the law of God. It was against us. In the words of our text, it was contrary to us because it apprised us of the enormous distance between us and God and constrained us to leave God rather than coming to Him. It gave the advantage to sin, not to man. We ought to see here that an external code, the handwriting of ordinances, not something in the heart, handwriting of ordinances on tables of stone, an external code cannot accomplish inward purity. Inward cleanliness, forgiveness, purity, sanctification cannot be accomplished from the outside inward. You cannot conform to a set of rules and thereby become pure before God. Thus the law, who was, which was external and which demanded working from the outside inward, had to be taken out of the way. Our text tells us that when we were baptized, God blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Thus righteousness is demonstrated to not come by the law, not come by adhering to a moral code. 
Galatians 2.21 says that if righteousness came by the law, we frustrate the grace of God. God must justify you because he wants to, not because he has to. He has to be constrained by his love for man, not by man attempting to line up with a moral code, which actually extends further than his abilities extend. The law was neutral. Its main interest was not man. And the law was not of faith. Galatians 3.12 tells us, the law is not of faith. That is to say, the law, the moral code, the handwriting of uh, ordinances that were contained in stone, these things could not produce faith. Hearing what you ought to do cannot make you believe. Faith or believing comes by hearing the testimony of what has been done in your behalf by another, the Lord Jesus Christ. The law and faith are then incompatible. They can't come together. And the just live by faith. Therefore, they cannot live by law. To wrap this up, we might say that the law is our schoolmaster, according to Galatians 3.24, to bring us to Christ. Not to justify us, but to get us ready to be justified. Jesus Christ took the law out of the way, nailing it to the cross. I think it's in order for us to expound this. This is a very difficult subject, at least it was for me for many years. And it may be for you to identify why the law was taken out of the way and the benefits that accrued from it. Jesus Christ, Romans 10 and verse 4 says, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now, if you're a believer, and a believer is someone that has believed and has been baptized, if you're a believer, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to you. To put it in the words of our text in Colossians 2.14, when you were baptized into Christ, buried with Christ by baptism, God blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against you and took it out of the way. Christ is the end of the law as a means to being righteous. You are not righteous because of what you do. You are righteous because of your conformity to what Christ has done. Your baptism puts you into Christ, and that's where the righteousness is. The law was without Christ. It depended thoroughly and completely upon your conformity to the moral code. You had to do every single thing God said to do. You had to do it 100%. With the law was no grace, no strength, no mercy, no provision for a mistake. If you offended at one point, you were guilty of all. The law of God was like a log chain. In it were like ten links. If you broke one of the links, the chain was useless. The law, the law was futile if it was broken at any point. Christ is the end of that system. He's the beginning of a new order whereby we believe unto righteousness. When we obey the gospel and come into Christ, we actually participate of God's righteousness rather than developing our own. Let me put it in the words of 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. Staggering verse, and I trust that you're able to receive it. For he, that is God, hath made him, that's Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Have you thought of yourself as being made the righteousness of God in Christ? This is the proclamation of this text. If you're in Christ Jesus, you have been made the righteousness of God. That brought an end to the law for righteousness. That meant the handwriting of ordinances that was against you was blotted out. Now, rather than what God says identifying where you're wrong, what God says identifies where you're right. It identifies that those that are in Christ are accepted with him. Now this truth is associated with your baptism. Again, Colossians 2.12, buried with him by baptism. And wherein you were raised by faith in what God was doing. And what God was doing, and you have to believe this. If you didn't know it then, you must know it now. What God was doing was taking away the law as your inhibitor. 
The law cannot condemn you when you're in Christ Jesus. You see, you are baptized into his death. Romans 6, 3, and 4 teaches that also. And it was in Christ's death, according to Ephesians 2, 15, that Jesus Christ abolished the law. Now let's take a moment and read this. We want to identify clearly for you what it means for the law to be done away or abolished. Ephesians 2, 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. When Christ died in his body, bearing our sins on the tree, the law of God that was against us, that is the law in its condemning capacity, was taken out of the way. The law can't condemn you anymore, believer. Not in Christ Jesus. That's what it means. He blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. That's what it means. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. You've been forgiven and the law can't deal with a guiltless person. The law can't condemn an innocent, forgiven person who's been separated from his sins. Thus, the handwriting of ordinances were obviated, done away, because it was given that all the world might become guilty. But in Christ Jesus, you've become guiltless, robbing the law of its power. Now, in the words of Romans, the seventh chapter and verse four, we've been delivered from the law, becoming dead to it, that we might be married to another. We have been made inaccessible to the law. The law of God sent by God into the world, speaking of it in a personal manner, searched abroad across the earth to convince people of sin, to make people aware that they come short of the glory of God and were unacceptable to God. Now that you're in Christ Jesus, you have been made inaccessible to the law. It cannot condemn you. It cannot get a hold of you. Let's put it in words of Scripture. Anchor it in the revelation of God. Romans the 8th chapter and verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. None at all. That's the work of the law. The law's work has been done away in Christ Jesus. But the purpose was not just to get rid of condemnation. The objective in becoming a Christian, if you prefer to look at it that way, is not just to avoid hell. It's not just to escape condemnation. The purpose is to become involved in righteousness, to go to be forever with the Lord ultimately, and to live and labor with Him here. Or according to Romans, the seventh chapter in verse four, and these are lovely and intimate words. Wherefore, my brethren, and think of yourself as Paul's brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. You also are become dead to the law, inaccessible to it, by the body of Christ. That's the body that bore our sins on the cross. That you should be married to another even to him who is raised from the dead, that you should bring forth fruit unto God. So that's the reason why sins are remitted. That's the reason why the law is robbed of its power, so that you can be joined intimately to the Lord Jesus Christ and bring fruit to God. What is fruit to God? Fruit, speaking in a generic manner, is the divine life expressing itself through you. It's when the mind of God works through your mind and the purpose of God is fulfilled in your life. Now you've been baptized into Christ and made dead to the law so you can produce fruit to God. So God can get glory through your life by working through you, the living God of heaven, whom the heavens of heaven cannot contain. That God will come and dwell in you and express himself through you. He will actually implement his purpose through you as you're in Christ Jesus. I find that fruit to be a glorious thing. It's so different from being justified by the deeds of the law. Romans 8 and verse 3 says, The law was weak through the flesh. You might put it like this. that We used to have steam engines when I was a lad. A train the engine with a large boiler. Steam would build up in this boiler and the power of that steam would propel the wheels of the engine and it would move. Now the law is like steam. 
but it was weak through the flesh. The flesh is like the boiler, but it's like cardboard. It's not able to contain the potency and the power of the law of God. When you take the law of God and put it in an unregenerate heart, it explodes it like steam would explode a boiler made of cardboard. It was weak through the flesh. Thank God we've been delivered from it. We couldn't contain it anyway. So there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus, and it's all associated with your baptism. Isn't that a refreshing, refreshing thought? That something so great as being delivered from the law and being pronounced innocent before God and being righteous, becoming the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that that could be associated with something that you have done, with something you have obeyed the form of doctrine delivered unto you. God's made the association, and you must not deny it. You have in Christ Jesus been accepted. God receives you. Men may not receive you because of their infirmity and because they're unaware of what you are in Christ Jesus. But Ephesians 1 and verse 6 makes the pronouncement, you've been baptized into Christ, says he has made us accepted in the beloved. God accepts you not because of what you've done. God accepts you not because of the perfectness of your deeds, not because of the spotlessness of your morality, but because you're in Christ, because you've been baptized in Christ. God accepts you, and the law cannot condemn you. There is, and this is a divine pronouncement, it's a commitment from God, lay hold of it, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. God doesn't condemn you. Christ doesn't condemn you. Even the holy angels of God do not condemn you. You must not condemn yourself and you must not permit men to condemn you. There is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. The law was given that every man's mouth might be stopped, but when you came into Christ Jesus, the condemning mouth of the law was stopped, and you are made innocent before the living God. He has forgiven us all trespasses. That's the word of Colossians 2, 12 and 13. Having forgiven us all trespasses, and the law cannot condemn a forgiven man. You have been justified, justified in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3, verses 24 through 27 tell us that. We've been justified by faith, and we're children of God by faith, having been baptized into Christ Jesus and having put him on, as that text says. You're justified, and the law can't condemn a justified person. A justified person is someone whom God views just as if he'd never sinned. His sins have been separated so completely from him that the all-seeing, omniscient eye of God cannot see them. The law, you see, has been blotted out because of your forgiveness. You've been delivered from the law. Oh, it was a tyrant. It, it pummeled our conscience and made us guilty before God and drove us away from God. It caused many a soul to cry out, Woe is me, and run from God and hide like Adam and Eve but we've been delivered from the condemning law. It can't condemn us any longer. In fact, in Christ Jesus, we love God's law now because it speaks our preference. It tells us what we desire. It is not against us. And we've been delivered from the law to be married to another, to be intimately joined with Christ and bring fruit to God. This is a holy marriage. Christ and you Great producing results that honor God and that God, God is glorified in these results. Now, you're not justified merely because you did what was right when you were baptized. What you did, your baptism, it was right. But justification comes because it identified you with Christ's death, and that's where sin was made an end of. That's where sin was put away. That's where the law was made an end of. That's where it was abolished once and for all in Christ's death. And your baptism puts you into his death where those divine resources and benefits are enjoyed. You cannot be brought into a realm where the law condemns and be in Christ. Or to put it positively, when you are in Christ Jesus, 
the law cannot condemn you. You are inaccessible to it. You see, the law of God, the holy law, as a means to righteousness, presumes that you're alienated from God. It presumes you want to do the wrong thing, and it presumes you're an enemy of God, and thus it identifies the areas where you fall short. But in Christ Jesus, you're not an enemy of God. You're a son of God. You're not alienated from God. You've been reconciled unto God. Oh, I know that there's imperfections in your life. If any man says he has no sin, he's a liar and the truth is not in him. But you must not, let me emphasize this, you must not let your sin keep you back from God. You must not hide in the bushes and bulrushes of life to hide from God because you've committed sin. You must come to him boldly. Ashamed that you've sinned, yes, but confess that you've sinned as a son of God, confess it. And the word of the Lord says he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It would be wrong for God not to forgive you that are in Christ Jesus. Now, you must capitalize upon that. Now let's just briefly review the things that we have seen here. The law was blotted out. The handwriting of ordinances that was against us was blotted out and we were baptized into Christ's death. It was removed in its condemning power. It can no longer bring us down in alienation from God. It can no longer defile our conscience. We've been cleansed and purged from sin in Christ Jesus. And the strength of sin is the law. Sin being removed, the law has no more condemning word that it can say to you. Christ took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross when he died. Your baptism identified you with that death, made you a part of his death with the law was made an end of. Remember, an external code cannot make a pure heart. Your purity of heart comes by an action of God. When God, by an act of his will, because he wants to, because he loves you, purges you from sin. And when he purges you from sin, when he cleanses your heart of the violations of his law and makes you guiltless before him, the law's mouth is stopped and you're free to be married to Christ Jesus.